Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. I'm Ben Rue, Program Associate here at the Forum on Workplace Inclusion. I am pleased to have you here today for eight strategies for creating a more inclusive volunteer program with presenter Lisa Jocelyn of the Minnesota Association of Volunteer Administration. This is the 10th and final webinar of our 2020 Forum on Workplace Inclusion webinar series sponsored by Aon. We hope you enjoy this experience and find this information helpful in your work and join us for future webinars in 2021. Today, Lisa will be presenting for about 45 minutes with Q&A at the end. Due to recent security issues, the chat will not be opened. Please utilize the Q&A feature to ask any questions. There will be a poll in this webinar, so feel, please feel free to participate in that. At the end of the webinar, you'll be asked to fill out a brief survey on your experience. Please take a moment to fill out this survey as your feedback helps us shape future webinars. We truly appreciate your open and honest feedback. Today's webinar is Sherman HRCA eligible. The activity IDs will be provided at the end of the webinar. Uh, certificates are available upon request. If you need one, just please feel free to email me directly. It is also being recorded and be, uh, being broadcast live on Facebook. The recording will be posted on our website within, a, within the next week. Visit our website, forumworkplaceinclusion.org, or follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn for more information. Before I share things, send things over to a, our, a brief message from our sponsor, I do have a brief message from our executive director, Steve Hummerkaz. As you know, the forum is dedicated to providing the very best learning and development programming for diversity, equity, and inclusion education. During regular times, we provide webinars and podcasts on a variety of topics on a monthly basis throughout the year, as well as our flagship conference, which is coming up in the spring. During the, these virtual times, we are working even harder to present more programming for you, including some specific to COVID-19 pandemic and the impact on our workplaces, ourselves, and especially underserved populations. We provide most of our resources like this webinar for free. We are able to do this thanks to generous support of community of the community. We know these resources have great value to you since so many of you regularly participate and we're grateful for the virtual offerings that to be full beyond capacity, many of them. Like many other organizations, we are experiencing challenges due to the pandemic in order to sustain our work, the, we have added a donation button to our website and to each podcast and webinar page. We ask that you donate what you feel is the value of this service to help us continue to bring the very best DEI training to you and to, to help us fulfill our mission of engaging people, advancing ideas, igniting and igniting change. Every donation is fully tax deductible and greatly appreciated. Now, before I hand things over to Lisa, I would like to hand things over to our sponsor, Aon, for a brief message. Where will today take you? Where will you take today? Will you step out into who you are, into who you can be? At Aon, we're committed to helping you be your best and ensuring you experience the best of Aeon. It's your chance to own your potential. A chance to develop professionally through unmatched opportunities and tools to help you succeed. It's your opportunity to work with the best, to learn from and grow with each other. A place where colleagues value one another, where perspectives are embraced and people are celebrated. It's freedom to reach out and make a difference so clients succeed, so communities grow, so colleagues thrive. This is what it means to work at Aeon, what it feels like when we are at our best. Impact, people, opportunities, and support. This is the Aeon colleague experience, and together it's how we'll empower results. Thank you, Aeon, for your support. And without further ado, I would like to go ahead and hand things over to Lisa. Thank you, Ben. Um, I am going to share my screen here. All right. Oops, all right. 
All right. Um, thank you so much, Ben, and thank you to the Forum on Workplace Inclusion for having me today. And thank you for, to all of you for being interested in this topic and, and for spending a little time here. Um, my name is Lisa Jocelyn, and I am the, in, the Equity and Inclusion Manager at MABA, which is the Minnesota Association for Volunteer Administration. I have been at MABA for about four years, working on looking at racial equity and inclusion in volunteer engagement. And so our work really started with a lot of our member organizations coming to us and saying, you know what, our volunteers don't reflect the racial and ethnic diversity of the communities that we serve and that we support. And we know that's a problem, but what should we do about it? And we didn't really have an answer. And so Mava has been digging into that for the past four years. And I've been working along with a task force um, that is made up of um, representatives from community-led organizations, BIPOC volunteer leaders, really a, a group of people who are committed to making volunteerism more equitable. And so I'll be talking more about all of that in a little bit, but I do want to start off by telling you just a bit about MAVA. So MAVA's mission is to connect, educate, strengthen, and advocate for volunteer engagement leaders and their organizations to positively impact communities. And as I said, we've been doing work around inclusive volunteerism specifically since um, 2017, but we actually have been doing some work around engaging immigrant communities and um, building more diversity in volunteerism since 2010. <clears throat> so we've been working on this for a while and recognizing that there's a lot of work that needs to be done. Um, and just the, for some of you may be familiar with MAVA, some of you might not be, but we really are kind of the, um, the professional development and membership organization for volunteer engagement leaders. So we provide networking, training, um, advocacy, and we also do research in the field. And that's where the work that I'm doing um, comes in, is trying to do research to advance the field as a whole in Minnesota and beyond. With that, I'd like to learn a little bit more about you and who's in the room. I know we have about 200 people on here today. So if you would uh, do a quick poll, uh, what type of organization do you work with? And I would say whatever organization you feel like you're kind of representing today, maybe you work at, at a corporation, but you're here because you're chair of the board of a nonprofit, whatever you want to, whatever you most are feel affiliated with today. Um, so what type of organization do you work with? Nonprofit, corporate, government, education, or other? So I'll give you a second to uh, pop that into the poll. Okay, awesome. I'm seeing about, uh, 50% nonprofit, about 25% uh, corporate, 17% government, 10% education, 6% other. So, okay, that is great to know. Um, the This presentation is um, was initially created really for nonprofits and for volunteer engagement leaders, but it also has a lot of things that are applicable across uh, sectors. And so I'm gonna be focusing on the strategies that are most applicable across sectors, but I'll be touching on all of the strategies. Uh, since I only have about 45 minutes, um, there'll be a few that I touch on pretty briefly, but others that I'll go into in a little more depth. All right. All right, so um, before we kind of really dig into everything. I just want to invite everyone to kind of take a moment. I know we've all had whatever has happened to us this morning. We're all probably still working from home. Um, you might have kids doing distance learning. Just try and take a moment to kind of just drop everything else aside and give yourself permission to just focus in on what you're learning here today. Um, and I know that's hard, but Sometimes I think it's helpful to just remind yourself like, no, okay, I can, I can put everything else aside. Um, I have to do that a lot too. So we're all in kind of this different world right now where it's hard to separate our lives from our work. So I invite you to uh, just try and do that for the next hour and um, listen and learn and, and take in what, what Mava has been, uh, been researching. So with that, the first strategy um, that I'm going to talk about is shift your language. And this is a pretty easy strategy, but it also is really foundational to the work that we're doing. And it, it's, it, it's been surprising to me because I've been in volunteer engagement for about 15 years. And so I've always felt 
I've always thought that volunteer and volunteerism is this win-win, wonderful rainbows, unicorns, marshmallows, wonderful thing that everybody loves. And as I began in this work around diversity, equity, and inclusion in volunteerism, it became clear pretty quickly that the word volunteer is not universally understood in the same way. In some communities, um, in some immigrant communities, there's not a direct translation in the, their native language to the word volunteer in English. Um, for some communities, the word volunteer is really associated with court ordered community service. And for other people, maybe they've had a bad experience with volunteering alongside or being in contact with volunteers who had kind of a white savior complex and really made volunteerism not feel like something that is welcoming and inclusive to everyone. To add a little bit more to that, I like to show the definition of volunteer because this I think is really telling. Definition of volunteer is someone who does something without being forced to do it, such as a person who does work without getting paid to do it. And when I first looked this up, I was very surprised because this is not the rainbows, unicorns, marshmallow definition I was thinking of. It has a lot of force in it without being forced to do it, without getting paid to do it. It doesn't sound super happy. It sounds some, like something that you kind of wonder, well, why would someone do that? And if you think about it from the perspective of maybe someone who is out of work or someone who is struggling to make ends meet, this doesn't sound like something that's accessible because to work without getting paid to do it, if you need money, um, that doesn't, doesn't sound like something you can do. On the other hand, as I've been talking with a lot of BIPOC volunteers and BIPOC volunteer managers, a word that a lot of people are more comfortable with or just find that they use more often is the word help. And the word help isn't perfect. I'm not saying that, that it is, but if you look at the definition of help, to give assistance to, to make more pleasant or bearable, to be of use to, or to change for the better. And to me, that sounds like something that everyone can do and should do. And so it's been very interesting for me, and I think it's very foundational to this work to understand that when you're working with BIPOC communities, volunteerism is happening, but it's often not being called that. It's called, I'm helping out at church, I'm helping my neighbor, I'm taking a friend to the doctor, I'm watching my grandkids or my cousin's kids or whomever, cooking meals for someone who is injured or sick. <clears throat> it's that neighbor to neighbor informal type of helping one another that's happening very prevalently in BIPOC communities. And so the word volunteer often isn't applied there. And it's important to realize that because when you walk up to someone and say, do you want to volunteer? Depending on that person's lived experience, they may or may not think of themselves as someone who volunteers or as someone who volunteering is accessible to. Another thing that's really important when you're talking about language <clears throat> or when you're thinking about language is focusing on how volunteers can help their community instead of how they help your organization. So I know I previously worked at the Red Cross and a lot of times when we were recruiting volunteers, we would talk about, here's how you can help the Red Cross or you know, here's how you can help Habitat for Humanity. Here's how you can help our organization. And you have to understand that for volunteers who have close proximity to the communities being supported, helping the organization isn't very persuasive. That's, that's not super appealing. The focus needs to be on helping the communities or supporting the communities or serving the communities. And so putting the focus back on the people or the cause as opposed to the organization is really helpful when you're looking at recruiting volunteers who actually live or work or have family who live in the communities that are being served. And so I tell you all this not to say that you should drop the word volunteer altogether, that that's not, not a good solution, but just so that you recognize that the word volunteer in and of itself is a barrier. And I'll talk a little bit later about how to overcome that barrier. But when you're having informal conversations with people, you don't always have to say, do you want to volunteer? You can talk about, you know, how, how do you support your community? How, how do you help? Would you be interested in, in helping the community through this organization, but not necessarily helping the organization? 
Um, so just thinking about how important language is, is a really good starting point to this work because language can be a huge barrier. And I'll put in a little plug right here that if anyone is interested in really digging deeper into this, um, one of my colleagues, Wendy, has a fantastic workshop about crafting inclusive language around volunteer recruitment um, that really digs into it in a great way. So I'm, I'm happy to answer questions about it, that if anyone really wants to dig into this more. So I go from that, which is, I would say, kind of the easiest strategy, although in and of itself, if you just shift your language, that's probably not going to do a lot. Um, but it has to be done in conjunction with other activities and other things that, that you're working on. But I move from that to probably the hardest strategy, which is build relationships. Building relationships is absolutely essential to building new relationships and to engaging volunteers from communities that are not currently represented in your volunteer pool. One of the things that you really have to keep in mind is that most people report that they volunteer because of a personal ask, because a friend or family asked them. And so to that end, volunteer opportunities only get as far as the networks that know about them. So if you're looking at a white-led organization that has primarily white volunteers, more likely than not, many of the friends and family of those individuals are going to look like them and come from similar backgrounds. And so in order to get beyond that, you need to build relationships and you need to be in contact and building those relationships with new people. And that is also how you get past that idea of volunteerism isn't for me. Because when you get to know someone and are able to invite them into your organization or into your work based on their interests and the, the things that you have learned about them, that's a much more appealing ask than just saying, hey, can you volunteer with this organization? So digging into build relationships a little bit. Um, the first thing that um, is important and I think it is, a, is good to give yourself permission to do is it's okay to be specific. So when I've worked with a lot of nonprofits, they say, well, you know, we serve 20 different neighborhoods that have different cultural backgrounds and we just don't know what to do. And time and time again, as I've worked with my task force, I've heard it's okay to start with one particular group. Um, you can't build relationships with 20 different communities at once. And so be thoughtful about why you're starting with a particular group. Maybe you've seen a huge rise in the use of your services by the Latinx community, or maybe your organization is in close proximity to a large Somali community, or maybe at your company, you are hiring more and more um, East Asian individuals to work there. And so, you know, you're, you're looking at, you know, where should we start and how can we build relationships with this particular group of people and with leaders in the community, learn from that experience and then move on to other groups. But give yourself permission to, to be specific and to start small, because if you try and take on too much, you, you, can't, you can't make 200 friends at once. And building relationships is about making friends and spending time with people. And so it's okay to be specific, learn from that, and then take that as you move to other groups. Another really important thing, even more important, is being authentic. So a lot of BIPOC communities have had the very unfortunate experience of people coming in and saying, hey, what do you think? You know, tell us how you want this, this to look. Tell us how we can change our, our systems or our strategies to, to make, make this better for you. And then often whoever came in never loops back, never says, here's what we did with the information you offered. Um, and that's a really, it's just a really disheartening thing to do. And so you have to recognize that when you are approaching um, community led organizations or BIPOC community members, or even your BIPOC volunteers who maybe currently are with your organization, you have to be authentic in why you want to have those conversations. And so you have to be able to articulate that both to yourself and to them, and also to your colleagues at your organization or company in order to say, you know, this is why we're doing it. And it can't be because, oh, I have a goal for this year to increase our volunteer diversity to 20% people of color. No, that, that's, not, that's not a good reason. That's, that's an outcome and you really can't control that very much. The reason needs to be, I know that it's problematic that most of our volunteers 
are white and don't look like the community that we're supporting. And I know that if we're able to engage the community that we're supporting, we will be able to provide better services, build more trust in the community, provide more culturally competent relationship building experiences, and we'll be able to meet our mission better and we'll be able to better support the community because of that work. And so really knowing that, understanding that, and being able to articulate that to everyone that you are working with is really important because authenticity is really key. And with authenticity comes follow-up. So if you are authentic, you don't just ask someone what they think and then walk away and never talk to them again. You have a follow-up conversation, say, you know, this is what I did with, you know, I, I was thinking about what, what you told me and, and here's what I'm doing as a result of that. And here's what I think next steps would be. And what do you think about that? And so it's important that you continue those relationships and don't just have it be transactional because that's what that's what's happened a lot in the past and it's it's not a good way to go about things so the next question that i often get is okay so how do i start building relationships um and this is often from volunteer managers but i think it goes for any nonprofit staff or anyone across the board how do you build relationships with bipoc communities if you don't currently have them and there's no there's no surefire way to do this i mean a lot of it is just putting yourself out there but one potential way is identifying groups that represent the community or events that celebrate the community and reaching out or being present at those events. So instead of, you know, inviting someone to come to your open house, go to them, go, go to their cultural celebration, have a booth. And maybe that first year that you're there, you might only talk to five or six or eight people, but don't evaluate the effectiveness of your time based on how many people you talk to, because you can't put a value on that presence. And simply having presence there and spending time shows that you're willing to make an investment. And that is extremely worthwhile. So thinking about how can we be more present in these communities, in events that celebrate these communities, how can we connect with organizations that specifically serve these communities and by, are led by community members? And understanding that when you reach out to organizations that are community led, you're probably not going to be able to get, say, the executive director of that organization to partner with you because the executive director of that organization has a lot of people calling them wanting to partner. So be thoughtful about what you're asking. Maybe it's, hey, do you have someone in your network or a volunteer who is really interested in this cause? And it, would it be possible for me to connect with them and talk to them about the work we're doing, how we'd like to better engage the community and maybe get some of their ideas around that. So be thoughtful about what you ask so that you're not asking the same thing that everyone else does and really stretching, trying to stretching people too thin. Um, another key piece for larger organizations is collaborate with other people in your organization. So particularly if you're doing outreach outside of the organization, um, you know, make sure that your different departments are talking to one, of the, one another because there's nothing more confusing than having the same organization reach out to you, but have it be multiple people who don't know what the other one is doing. So just making sure that as you begin these efforts, you're coordinating with others who are also doing outreach and trying to build new relationships. Um, another piece for nonprofits potentially is hold open houses, invite people to come to you or go to the community and have a, a celebration or um, have kind of an open house in the community so people can learn about what you're doing, what you have to offer and how they might be able to be involved. And then the last point I'll say here is be persistent because again, building trust takes time. And sometimes it takes more than one email or one phone call. And you have to recognize that not getting a response to an email, it doesn't mean that that person isn't interested. It just probably means that they've gotten a hundred other requests that week and they're not sure if you're serious. So be persistent, continue to build those relationships, show up to events that, that matter. And just, it, it takes time. I mean, that's the thing that's really important to realize here is that you're not gonna build relationships strong relationships in a week or a month or even a year. This is multi-year work. And it's actually, it's really, COVID has made it even difficult, more difficult. Um, hopefully we're seeing the light at the end of this tunnel where we will be able to meet with people in person and we'll be able to have community celebrations again. But I'll admit that, you know, working from home and not being able to meet with people has made this even harder. And a lot of what I've encouraged nonprofits to do during this time is to just make sure that you're maintaining the relationships that you've already started. 
and checking in and seeing you know how organizations are doing and how community members are doing what they need and how you can support them okay so the next few i'm going to go through a little bit more quickly um and then the the final two i'll, I'll um, spend a little bit more time on again but um the next one is understand the importance of socioeconomic status and this is really important because traditional volunteers tend to be early retired affluent white people. I mean, most of the organizations that I work with, that is the, the core of their volunteer pool is retired affluent white people. And so you have to recognize that that group of people is going to have different needs than people who are working, who have kids, who um, are, you know, are working multiple jobs, who are unemployed, um, you know, many, many different backgrounds. And as you look to diversify your volunteer pool, you have to recognize that you're going to recruit people who have different financial situations and who have different needs. And it's important to think of this in terms of equity as opposed to equality. Equality is giving everyone the same thing. Equity is giving everyone what they need. And so some of the things that you can do to make volunteering a little bit easier for people who are either kind of in survival mode or are just kind of moving out of survival mode is childcare. You know, maybe your current volunteers don't have an issue with childcare because they can, even if they have children, they can afford to pay a babysitter to come while they're volunteering, but that's not the case for everyone. And so childcare is a huge barrier. It's super expensive and being able to provide some sort of childcare for volunteers in order for them to participate or making events that are in the evening family friendly can be a huge way to be more welcoming. Um, offering transportation stipends, particularly if the place that the volunteerism needs to occur, say if it has, has to happen at your office, um, if that is located downtown or, or you know not very close to the community where um, a lot of your volunteers live, you know, not everyone has a car and not everyone can afford parking. So offering transportation stipends can really alleviate that barrier of getting to the volunteer opportunity. Food in person, it's always a wonderful thing. Everybody loves having food. And it just says, it's, it says, we want you here, we welcome you and here's, here's our gift to you. Um, and another thing is thinking about gift cards or tickets to outings. When we think about traditional volunteer recognition, it's often everybody gets the same thing. And when you think about engaging volunteers from different backgrounds, the, vol the volunteer who really appreciates getting a plaque, um, that's great for them. But another volunteer might say, you know, I'd, how much did you spend on that plaque? I'd rather have a gift card to Target because, man, I can really use some new sheets or whatever it might be. Um, so thinking about what's meaningful for different people who are in different situations. And another thing that I really like to mention here um, that one of my task force members pointed out to me, I think is just really important. Um, when I was at the Red Cross, we were super fortunate to get a lot of tickets donated to us. So like the twins and the saints would donate tickets to our volunteers. And we would, of course, do this very fair thing of, okay, we'll give out the tickets in pairs. And if you want if you want to be considered, send an email in, we'll enter everyone in a drawing. And that's really catering to people who, you know, going to the Twins game is maybe kind of a nice to have. But when you think about it, if, if someone who is, you know, not really affluent, has a family of five, if you give them two tickets to the Twins game, that's not gonna help them at all because they'd either have to find childcare that they could pay for, or it's, it's just not gonna work. But if you gave them five tickets to the Twins game, that might be an outing that would make their year that they maybe couldn't have done otherwise. And so just thinking about where are people coming from and what could this mean to them and how can we make it the most meaningful to them? Um, and so as you look to recruit volunteers from different backgrounds and from different lived experiences, it's really important to think about how you're recognizing volunteers and what amenities you're offering to make it a little bit easier for people to engage with you. So the next strategy is embrace skill-based opportunities. Um, if you don't know what skill-based opportunities are, these are opportunities that really build on like a professional skill that someone has. So often you think of graphic designers, um, artists, writers, 
um, maybe accountants, um, people who are strong in finance. Um, I would say actually that all board members are skill-based volunteers because they're bringing leadership skills. So there's a lot of skills that people can bring to volunteer opportunities. But what I found with a lot of the organizations that I'm working with is some of the organizations that have been most successful in engaging new immigrant communities have been those that offer a lot of skill-based opportunities. Because there are a lot of people who are looking to build their resumes in the US, um, either because they can't currently work um, in the US but are hoping to soon, or because they haven't worked in the US before and a lot of employers don't really consider work experience from other countries. And so they're looking to build up their, you know, their US resume. So how can you offer opportunities that really do build skills and do offer someone some insight into to the workplace? And this is the one place where it is really beneficial to post them online because a lot of times job seekers are very accustomed to searching online. Um, so in most cases, I would say building relationships, building relationships. But in this case, online listings do actually work pretty well. But making sure that when you have opportunities for or things that people could help with that do require a certain skill, whether it's, you know, a high level skill or whether it's, you know, admin and filing work or, um, you know, being the face of the organization to the community, whatever it might be, be sure that you're posting those and letting people know that this is an opportunity that they can do while they're looking for paid employment. And what I've heard from a lot of nonprofits is, oh, I don't know if that's gonna be a good return on investment because this person might only stay with us for a month or two. They're probably gonna leave when they get a job. But we have to make that okay because the time and energy that someone gives an organization, even if it's just for a month or two, when they're bringing a skill in, that is incredibly valuable. And it's also an incredibly valuable experience for, for them to be able to have some insight into the American workplace and to be able to build the professional network. And so don't let that time constraint stop you from engaging a really potentially amazing volunteer just because it might not be a long time. So that all goes along with be flexible, consider short-term volunteers, and also thinking about internships, um, I am of the mindset that internships should be paid, but I know we still have a lot of organizations that can only offer unpaid internships. So if you are doing that, um, think about where you're recruiting from and you know, don't just recruit from the private college down the street, but also recruit from the community college that's a few miles away. Um, look at who their student population is and maybe who can most benefit from the opportunities that you have. Okay, so the next strategy is number five, uh, recruit from those who use your services. And this is one I could go into a lot of detail on, but I'll try and keep it pretty, pretty light. Um, a lot of times nonprofits don't allow people who have used their services to engage as volunteers. So an example would be a food shelf. If you've received food from a food shelf, very often that food shelf will say, well, you, you can't volunteer with our food shelf. Maybe you could volunteer with another program, but, or maybe if there's a certain amount of time between when you last receive services and you know, when you need them, then you can volunteer. But I, I have an issue with this because it really negates this natural human concept of, of reciprocity. When someone gives something to you or does something nice for you, you want, you want to give back to them. And I think it's important that we don't make it feel like an obligation um, for anyone who is receiving services from a nonprofit, but it's also important to recognize that the people who most understand how important the work of your organization is, are the people who have been affected by it and who have needed the support that you're offering. And so this is one where every organization needs to look at their policies and really think about why are these policies here? And if you can articulate a really good reason why those policies are there, I understand that. In some cases at, at, um, at shelters or at mental health organizations, you know, they don't want current, current clients to have access to, you know, the records of other clients. And I, I understand that. But there are other situations where honestly the policy has, is there because that's just how it's always been. And that's not good enough. So I really encourage organizations to look at all of your policies around volunteerism, around who can volunteer, around the barriers to volunteerism. Think, think about why are these here? 
And do we still have a good reason for why these are here? Or are they just kind of here to, to keep some people up? So that's another thing that I encourage you to do is just look at those policies. So strategy number six is partner to engage groups of youth. And this is one um, that is really more aimed at, at nonprofits, but a lot of youth, you know, teenagers, high schoolers are looking for service opportunities. It, it's just kind of, it, you know, it builds your resume, it builds your college applications. A lot of groups require them. So if you're in, you know, a lot of soccer teams or boy or girl scout troops will, will have, be looking for service opportunities. And a lot of times I think organizations kind of wait for these groups to come to them. So if you, you engage groups, you know, you've got certain groups that come to you. But I invite you to be more strategic about how can we engage groups that are more diverse and um, reflect the racial demographics of whomever we're serving. So maybe instead of contacting the National Honor Society at the Suburban High School, maybe you contact the Multicultural Club at the St. Paul High School. Um, just thinking about, you know, who are we intentionally reaching out to and how are we inviting them in to the opportunities that we have, whether it be ongoing opportunities or current op or one-time opportunities. Another thing that I like to say here is when I first started this work, I was like, well, maybe if, you know, organizations could get youth involved in, BIPOC youth involved in their organization, then that would kind of be a bridge to the adults in the community. And everyone around me was like, no. No, kids, kids don't want to do what their parents are doing and parents don't want to do what their teenagers are doing. So I quickly um, had the kibosh put on that, but recognize that, you know, engaging youth, maybe, maybe they'll participate with you for a little while and then maybe they'll go off to college or they'll get busy or have a family, but maybe they'll come back to you. And recognizing that just building that name recognition with um, teenagers is, is important and lets them know what you do and what you have to offer in the community. All right, so this one I'm gonna dig a little deeper into, remove barriers. So there are a ton of barriers to volunteerism. We really ask people to jump through a lot of hoops, to go, to, to volunteer, to help other people. And there are a lot of reasons for this. Um, and I can do a whole other workshop on this. I mean, ultimately the way I see it is that volunteerism, formal volunteerism with nonprofit organizations was created largely by and for affluent white people. And so the systems that we use to engage volunteers work well for affluent white people. And that's why you see volunteer pools that are not very diverse. And so we need to look at the barriers that these systems and structures put up and be really intentional about removing them. One barrier is lack of flexibility. And this is one that I think is just so, it's so interesting in volunteer engagement because I think we've gotten to this point where we almost ask volunteers to be like part-time staff members. You know, you need to show up at this time and you need to be here for this shift and you need to show up every week. And okay, if you're gonna go on vacation, you need, you know, you need to let us know how long you're gonna be gone for. Um, and that's fine for some roles, but it's not necessary for every role. And you have to understand that when you're working with parents, when you're working with communities that are closer knit and that have larger family systems that they take care of, there's a lot of obligations there. And being able to put your volunteer opportunity as your number one priority really is a luxury. And so how can you make volunteerism more accessible to people who do have other obligations? So do all your opportunities have to be during daytime business hours? Do you have opportunities for people to take a break? Do you have, um, you know, how harshly do you punish people if they can't show up for a shift? Can you let them reschedule? Um, thinking about, you know, if someone has a sick child or if somebody um, for example, has to choose between going to their volunteer opportunity or taking their grandmother to the doctor because they're the only one in their family who has a car. Well, clearly they will take their grandmother to the doctor and they should, and we should be encouraging that as volunteer engagement leaders. We need to, we need to make it okay for people to have lives outside of volunteerism. We need to embrace that and celebrate that. 
And so really looking at how can we make volunteer opportunities flexible and meet people where they're at in terms of the time they can give and the help that they want to offer. Another one is background checks. Background checks are tricky. Um, the big thing I would say here is that background checks don't only exclude people who have criminal histories. They also exclude anyone who has a fear of government, which is particularly true in a lot of immigrant communities and in the Latinx community right now. There are a lot of people who are just like, no, I will not do a background check. And it does not mean they have a criminal history. It just means that that is a step that they are not willing to take right now. And so I understand some opportunities you really do need to have background checks if you're working with, with kids, if you're working with vulnerable adults. But I also think that there are a lot of opportunities where you don't need background checks. And so I think it is a good idea to have a variety of opportunities and definitely have some ways that people can engage that doesn't require a background check so that that's not a barrier for any type of service within your organization. Um, another one here that I put is language. Language, of course, is very difficult. One thing that, that I've heard again and again is that if you can't take a volunteer through the entire process of volunteering in another language, don't advertise in that language because it's really, it's really misleading. So what you can do is understand that volunteering should be a safe place for people who are learning English um, and who have English as a second language. And so make it okay. Um, one of the organizations I've worked with is a literacy organization, and they previously had on their volunteer recruitment materials, um, only language requirement is you must know English. Well, they discovered that a lot of their ESL learners were interested in volunteering and giving back, but felt like, oh, well, English isn't my first language, and I don't have a college degree. I don't know if they want me. And so they changed that language to say, must what did they say? Um, something about um, must be able to understand English and be willing to teach others from your experience. So just thinking about how you're recruiting and what you're requiring, a lot of times, you know, language can be a barrier, but it doesn't have to be as big of a barrier as we make it sometimes. Another thing, I mentioned this before, so I won't go into a lot of depth, but exclu exclusive policies. Um, so you know, around volunteers being able or clients being able to volunteer. There are other policies, many, many policies with every volunteer program. Um, it's really important to look at your policies and think about why are these here? Do they need to be here? Do, does it need to be so formal? And why are we doing it this way? So with that, I'm going to move on to the last strategy and I'm doing pretty good on time. Um, so the last strategy, and this is another one that is extraordinarily important. Create an inclusive organizational culture. And I almost have to laugh at this because it's like, oh yeah, just go ahead and create an inclusive organizational culture. That's super easy. It's not. But you also can't not acknowledge it. Because organizational culture is, is key to whether or not volunteers will feel welcome, included in your organization, and if they'll want to stay. And so some things that you can do to influence culture at your organization, whether it is a nonprofit, government, education, corporate, is educate your colleagues across departments about why volunteerism is important and why it's important to engage volunteers from all communities and why it's important to remove barriers and be really thoughtful and intentional about diversifying the volunteers that you're working with. Gain support from organizational leaders. That is always helpful when um, someone who is high up is able to give you, you know, put some, some words out there in support of the work that you're doing. Um, but you can also create a culture of inclusion within your own department. So I know, you know, for a lot of nonprofit folks, it's like, well, you know, I'm not the, I'm not the ED. What can I do? Um, but for volunteer engagement leaders or for corporate responsibility leaders, you can really look at what, what can I do in this department? And maybe it's having lunch and learns for current volunteers where they can do kind of a book club and share and learn about, you know, books from, um, from BIPOC authors, you know, whether it be fiction or, you know, books about, um, about race equity. Um, there are a lot of things that you can do to really build education and build understanding, prioritizing educating your current volunteers on diversity, equity, and inclusion issues, such as 
implicit bias, microaggressions, white supremacy culture. These are all trainings that would be great for current volunteers to go through if you have a volunteer pool that's primarily white. And it's something that you need to do before you really work on diversifying your volunteers because you wanna make sure that new volunteers coming into your organization feel welcome and are brought into a, as safe of a space as you can create for them. All of this feels like a lot, but one thing you can always, always do is prioritize your own professional development around diversity, equity, and inclusion. So I know sometimes when we're talking about organizational culture, it feels like, oh my gosh, that's so big. How can I influence my organizational culture? But you can start with you. All of these things are intertwined. Individuals make up an organization and organizations and companies make up a sector. And all of those wheels go together to advance this work and to make volunteerism more equitable and more inclusive. And so start with you and learning and growing and being in a growth mindset about, you know, what, is, what does this look like? And how can I be more thoughtful about prioritizing diversity, equity, and inclusion in my life and in my work? So with that, um, I have the eight strategies up here. I'm not gonna read them again, but I do wanna say that all of this that I just went over is these are meant to be initial steps for you into this work. Um, my hope is that you'll be able to take some of these things and act on them right away. And you know whether it's going over your website to look at the language that you're using and whether or not you're focused on communities or on the organization, um, whether it's thinking specifically about who could I reach out to to start building relationships with. Um, my hope is that these are things that you can take away and you, you can act on right away and put in your 2021 work plan. What you also need to recognize is that these are only first steps. And if you do just this, it will only get you so far. Um, as I mentioned before, volunteerism is built on structural racism. And so we really need to look at how volunteerism operates and the very often we're promoting one right way of volunteering that involves, you know, application, background check, interview, training, and it, that appeals to some people, but it doesn't appeal to everyone. One right way always works best for one group of people. And so the work that MAVA is doing now is really looking at how can we build new systems and new pathways for volunteering that are co-created with BIPOC communities and that do really advance equity. And so I tell you that just so that you know that these are first steps and they're important steps and I hope that you will take them, but I hope that you won't stop there and that you'll continue to look at how can we break down barriers and how can we really dismantle the racism that is inherent within formal volunteerism within nonprofits and a lot of organizations that engage volunteers in that formal way. All right, so I went a couple minutes over, but I um, have my email up here and I think Ben is going to send out my email as well. You're also welcome to check out MAVA's website and our work um, around inclusive volunteerism, mavanetwork.org. But with that, I would be happy to take questions. Thank you so much, Lisa, for that wonderful webinar. As a um, nonprofit organization ourselves, that has a lot of, utilizes a lot of volunteers, especially around the uh, our annual conference, we really appreciate this, and I'm sure a lot of our listeners appreciate it as well. And we had a we have a couple or a couple good questions, so we're going to hop right in with the first one. Um, the first one is, can you, sh uh, actually about the, li uh, the link that you referenced, can you share the link to the item you mentioned about inclusive language and volunteer recruitment? We at uh, American Red Cross are launching a DEI experience for our volunteer recruiters. So that was a link that you mentioned kind of earlier in. Yeah, um, so it's not a specific link, but if you go to um, MAVA, actually just email me. <laughs> email me and I can send you the description for that workshop and some of the work we're doing around it and answer any questions that you have. And again, the email is ljocelyn at mavanetwork.org. Mm -hmm. Jocelyn is J-O-L, or sorry, J-O-Y-S-L-I-N. So next question, how has the virtual approach been with regards to individuals showing up? So, it, you know, in term, I'm guessing you're, you're asking in terms of volunteerism and you know people being able to volunteer. Um, it's been really 
interesting across the organizations that I worked with because we kind of have two camps of organizations. One are the basic need organizations that have continued to engage volunteers on site because they have a higher demand than ever. Um, food shelves are one classic example. And so our food shelves in particular have been looking at how can we engage more BIPOC volunteers because they're serving even more communities. And one organization I've been working with in particular has been really thoughtful about how can we engage more Spanish speaking volunteers to make sure that we have a Spanish speaking volunteer every shift because as COVID hit and their reach expanded, they have even more Spanish speakers coming to the food shelf and they wanna be able to serve them to the best of their ability. We have another camp of um, organizations that aren't engaging volunteers at all on site. And so they're doing some virtual work. A lot of organizations, this has been kind of a tough shift because virtual volunteerism happens, but it's not something that's super prevalent for a lot of organizations that use volunteers on site. So it's been a shift. And in terms of volunteers showing up, there certainly has been some drop off in terms of COVID, but there's also been people showing up to volunteer virtually who couldn't otherwise, um, and maybe you know couldn't get to the location or um, just didn't have the time before COVID, but now they do. At the same time, there's also people who are previously were volunteering, um, particularly those who are most you know older and most vulnerable to COVID that no longer will go in person, um, but maybe they're shifting to virtual volunteering. Um, and then you have other folks who maybe were volunteering before, but can't do virtual because they don't have internet access or they're um, supporting distance learning. So it's been, you know, across the board of a big variety. I would say from the organizations I'm working with for virtual volunteer opportunities, it's been about the same um, kind of no-show rate as in-person opportunities where, you know, you can, you can guess that some, some people aren't going to show up, but for the most part, you know, 75% are probably going to be able to make it. Thank you. And let's see, how do you determine what a volunteer wants slash needs in terms of recognition and give different things to different volunteers in an appropriate way? Like one volunteer gets a pin and the other gets a gift card. Yeah, um, I would say ask them. I think a really good practice is, you know, see if you can have kind of a, a focus group of volunteers that um, discusses recognition. So, you know, maybe it's something that you invite people to personally and you have kind of a round table of six or seven volunteers from different backgrounds and say, you know, here are some options we're looking at. What, what would you most appreciate? And from there, maybe narrow it down to, you know, one or, or two or three things and offer people a choice. Um, you know, everyone loves having choices and we don't have to give everyone the same thing across the board. So um, I think if you can use a small group to kind of get those ideas narrowed down and then offer a choice through a survey or, you know, whatever means you communicate with your volunteers, that's one way. Um, but I'm very open to other ways as well. These are just ideas. Great. And how do you feel about volunteering aiding people in accessing services? I, I make art in an artist run center that discounts studio costs for volunteers by a certain amount of volunteer hours for studio hours. It's not a bad strategy, but could get, a, could get weird for social service or health or food security organizations. Yeah, <clears throat> that's something that there's been some research on and I haven't been able to dig into it that much because there's, there's work around, you know, what if we paid volunteers? And you're not gonna be able to pay volunteers the salary that you would pay a staff member, but you know we offer stipends for interns and for project-based work sometimes. So I don't have a, a clear answer on this because I think you know laws and regulations around volunteering um, vary across states and, and all of that sort of thing. But I do think it's something worth exploring is what benefits can you offer to volunteers um, you know, within the legal parameters of what your state requires of your nonprofit, but what benefits can you offer to volunteers that maybe are outside the box or involve some of the very services that you provide? So that's a great example that you offered of, you know, being able to use the space at a discount because you're a volunteer. Um, some people might say that's not volunteering. You're basically, you're you know, getting a benefit from it, but I don't agree with that because I think, you know, it, everyone volunteers for a reason. And to be able to volunteer just because it makes you feel good, 
that's great. But a lot of people have more needs than that. And so being able to meet someone's need within that volunteerism, you know, a lot of people volunteer because they want to build their resume or want to build a professional network. That's, that's a give and take. Volunteerism is always a give and take. And I think we need to be more thoughtful and creative about how we can offer benefits to volunteers um, that maybe aren't the traditional benefits of, oh, you get a t-shirt and a pin and this warm, fuzzy feeling, um, because that's not what everyone needs. True, warm and fuzzies are great, but free stu or discounted studio space is better. <laughs> um, so the barriers you highlighted seem to be focused on those in a lower socioeconomic status. Can you highlight other barriers that aren't just about financial status, i.e. brand awareness, cultural competency of recruiters, competition yeah. for the time with churches, sororities, other community organizations, et cetera? Although they Absolutely. did a great, list, great job of listing quite a few right there. <laughs> Yeah, it, it, that, uh, those are the, some of the things I was going to say. So um, I've been really fortunate. Mav has been doing some listening sessions with um, BIPOC volunteers. And so I've been able to just listen to um, how some BIPOC volunteers are, um, how, how they approach volunteerism and how they respond to kind of the traditional volunteer structure. And what I'm hearing a lot is just that very structure of jumping through all of these hoops in order to help others just feels really like you're trying to keep people out. And that's not appealing. And for anyone who is thinking, eh, I don't know, I don't know if this organization wants me, there are so many places along the way that they could drop out, you know, application, orientation, interview, background check. So that's one thing is just these formal structures that aren't necessarily appealing to people who are accustomed to just helping out in, in the neighborhood and in the community and at church and through their sorority and, um, you know, through these organizations that make it very easy to help. Um, another really key piece is there's a lot of distrust of white-led organizations because a lot of BIPOC individuals have had negative experiences, either volunteering or working at white-led organizations. And the way there's just, a, there's, it's problematic. You know, and why do you have these white-led organizations serving a population that a population that's primarily BIPOC? You know, why why would you think that would work? And so there's a lot of mistrust of those organizations, and that's not easy to overcome. But I think one way you can start to do that is by building authentic relationships. I mean, another way is hire BIPOC staff by all means. I mean, there's a lot of things that need to happen. Um, but in terms of volunteers, building authentic relationships, getting to know people and inviting them in on their terms is an important piece. Um, also, just the cultural competency for sure is a huge barrier. Um, I had one listening session participant say, you know, when I volunteer with a formal nonprofit, I know I'm probably going to be the only Black person in the room at that orientation. And sometimes I'm up for that and sometimes I'm not. And really working with your white volunteers to make sure that they understand um, more about how to make a welcoming and inclusive environment and making sure that you are working with staff to ensure that and making sure that you are understanding the barriers. Um, all of that is really important. So all of those things that you mentioned, I think I just elaborated on a few of those, um, but those are absolutely barriers as well. So it's it's very much a, a complex layers of, of, of barriers that are happening both personally, systemically, and organizationally. So many layers. And do you have recommendations for evaluating um, volunteer programs for race equi racial equity? You know, I haven't seen any particular, um, you know, programs or systems. I, MAVA has done some of that work. Um, I think there are many things that would need to happen. Um, so thinking about how, how can we, first of all, evaluate our policies and procedures? Um, how can we look at who's currently volunteering with us and how do we bring those volunteers to the place that we need them to be? How do we dismiss volunteers that don't fit into having equity as a priority? 
Um, so there's a lot of different pieces there. Um, I'd be happy to talk through a lot of that with you, um, but I haven't seen like any organizations that's offering like a DEI volunteerism assessment yet, but I don't know, maybe, maybe we'll, we'll have to create one. Good idea. Um, what recommendations do you have specifically for employee research groups to engage diverse volunteers of corporations? So um, I'm not super familiar with employee research groups. Sorry about that. Um, but um, one thing that I didn't mention that I would love to see more companies doing is really when you're looking at volunteerism and maybe if you offer volunteer paid volunteer hours, being more um, thoughtful about how different people volunteer. So maybe people don't have to volunteer, you know, their, their volunteer hours don't have to be at an organization, but maybe it can be attending a protest. Maybe it can be helping neighbors. Maybe it can be mentoring a neighborhood youth. Um, people serve their communities in a lot of different ways, and it's not always through these formal nonprofit systems. And I think it's important to acknowledge that and allow people to give in the way that works best for them. Um, so I don't know if I answered your question at all. Um, that was just a, a side point about um, something that companies can think about in order to make their volunteerism practices more inclusive. Thank you. And um, how can we make volunteer op or programs more accessible and inclusive for people with disabilities? Absolutely. And I meant to mention this at the outset. MAVA's work has really been around racial equity and inclusion. So that's what I have spoken to, you know, and, and that's what my research has been about. Um, we're doing more research around um, people with disabilities. And one of the things that we're looking at is, of course, making online opportunities more accessible, doing closed captioning, um, having online opportunities be as accessible as possible. We just had a, a presenter at our recent conference present a whole workshop on that. Um, so we're starting to dig into that. Um, also just thinking about, you know, what, what is your building like? What do opportunities require? Um, I think across the board, looking at what you require volunteers to be able to do. Um, I saw a job posting once, and this is a job, not a volunteer opportunity, but it was like, volunteer must be able to stand for, you know, multiple hours and must be able to lift 20 pounds. And it was like an, an admin assist or an executive assistant job. And I was like, really though, you couldn't like, I, it just, you need to be thoughtful about do people really need to be able to do these things? That seems like a very small part of the job. Um, so I, I haven't done a ton of work in the disability space and that's something that we'd like to do more of, um, but those are just a few um, basic ideas. Thank you for that. And I've been informed by my colleague that we are running low on time. So this will unfortunately have to be our last question, um, but there are quite a few still really good questions that we've I haven't been able to get to. So Lisa has graciously ag agreed to do a follow-up podcast where we'll be getting to some of these um, questions that we weren't able to get to. So keep an eye out for that. But so the last question I'm going to um, gonna be asking is, uh, the nonprofit organization I work for is very grassroots and most of our volunteers have come to us via word of mouth or from friends, etc. So hence, they all look like one another. Any tips for more inclusive outreach to dive to invite diverse populations to recruit volunteers? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think the building relationships is really key. And you're right that word of mouth is a key way that people find their volunteer opportunities. So I would say start reaching out to, you know, if there are organizations that are doing similar work um, that are engaging more BIPOC communities, start there. Um, or just simply reach out to culturally led organizations. Um, you know, once we're past COVID, start attending cultural festivals and celebrations um, and just start really working on authentically building relationships one at a time. Um, that's gonna be the most important thing, um, but also you know, make it not just about you asking something of them, but also getting feedback from the people that you're meeting about your mission and the work that you're doing and how, um, how it can be more inclusive and how um, you know, how they might change the work that you're doing so that you can make the work, not only your volunteer pool more diverse, but also make your work more culturally competent, meaningful, and equitable. Great. Thank you so much, Lisa, and for everyone who participated in today's webinar. I want to do a special thank you to our webinar sponsor, Aon. 
as promised, the SHRM activity ID for the session is 20-973H as in hotel, E as in echo. And the HRC activity ID is 543905. The activity IDs were posted, it have been posted in the chat for um, everyone by my colleague Ernest. Again, I want to thank you so much, Lisa, um, for this webinar. Like I said, as a volunteer organization or a nonprofit organization, our volunteers are invaluable to us. So we just want to thank you for sharing this information. And if you would like to continue the conversation and learn more, please feel free to contact Lisa at ljocelyn at mavanetwork.org. That's L-J-O-Y-S-L-I-N at mavanetwork.org. Please feel free, please join us on January for our first webinar of our 2021 series, Seizing the Moment to Create a New, More Inclusive Normal with presenters Maureen berkner Boyd of Moxie Exchange, Becca Glenberg of Upstart, and Stephanie Douglas of Ungle on Thursday, January 21st, 2021 at 11 a.m. Central Standard Time. Uh, new episodes of the Forum podcast are now available. Visit forumworkplaceinclusion.org forward slash podcast to listen. You can also listen to them on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Anchor, and Stitcher. Thank you again, everyone, for joining us today, and we look forward to having you join us for future webinars, and we hope you have a happy and safe holidays. Thank you so much. Have a great day.